Amen. I meant to say earlier how much I appreciate uh, all that you folks do around here. Uh, there are so many things that are, are, are and have been happening. And um, I'm, I'm right now um, very appreciative of our trustees. And I'm, I'm thankful for them and the work that they do. Um, you know, there's just there's constantly repairs that are being done around here. And uh, these, every one of these guys have jumped in. They're helping out. We've got a number of projects that we're working towards. Uh, we've got some things we need to fix and address with, with regards to the uh, uh, playground um, and uh, to keep that refreshed and all. Um, there's a broken door. Uh, there's some floor refinishing that's going to be done. And just constant. There's just things that and I appreciate these men and what they're doing. And the Lord has blessed us in a great way. Um, I also want to go ahead, and I'm going to have Ethan is going to come. I, I forgot this a couple weeks that he's been, been here. We were supposed to start this a couple weeks ago. Uh, but we've been working here, Ethan and I, towards uh, his ordination. And uh, when he came on staff about a year and a half ago, um, that was one of the things that we had discussed was, uh, was the regards that um, I wanted to go ahead and work with him in regards to that. But he was adjusting for the first several months of being here in ministry, so we didn't start anything then. And then in November, he got married, and that's, that's been an adjustment as well, and uh, more for Mitzi than for him, you know. But uh, no, we, we, had to, uh, we had to make sure that uh, we didn't jump on things and, and uh, uh, that uh, everything went, uh, you know, he, he got out of the gate here well as far as uh, the marriage and um, that uh, I don't know what I'm going to say here. I just, uh, <laughs> I've just lost my wording here. I had something in my mind, but um, anyways, I was going to crack a little joke, but I thought, no, I better not do that. So uh, let me move on to the more sublime, okay? Uh, Ethan basically uh, is going to be saying some verses here on, um, on, some, on most Sunday nights, uh, as Eric did. How many of you remember Eric last year getting up on Sunday night saying verses? I believe one of the greatest things that a person can do as far as getting ordained is to memorize Bible Scripture. You know, I don't care who you are, at what age that you go ahead and get ordained, you're not going to know every answer. But here's the one thing that when I conduct an ordination quizzing that I want to make sure a candidate is going through. Does he know where to go for the answer? May not be able to fully explain it, may not be able to get his mind wrapped around the whole thing, but he knows where to go. And the pastor that I worked under did that for me, and it helped greatly. It settled the men that were asking the questions when they would ask a question, and I would go to a verse, and I would go to a verse, and it was a, a, just a great opportunity. So on Sunday night, Ethan will be citing these verses. I know you'll be with him on this process. It is one thing to cite the verses when you're by yourself. When you're in a car and you're going through the verses and you're rehearsing them, boy, you have them word perfect. But try getting up here and saying a verse in front of everybody else. So uh, be patient with him. I know you will be. And uh, so he's got his schedule moving along. So Ethan, why don't you come up and uh, share the verses that we have for tonight. John four twenty four. See, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Daniel 4.35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Isaiah 57.15, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him also that is of a humble and contrite spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Good. I like that. That's good. Wonderful. All right. Uh, take your Bibles, if you would, please. Turn to the book of 1 John, right in the New Testament, right towards the end. 1 John. And I want you to go to chapter number 1, the first chapter. And I'm going to go ahead and read the first uh, few verses. This will be our text for tonight. We'll be going, naturally, we'll be going through the, a lot of the book of John. But I want to go ahead and uh, touch on these verses here in our opening. 
The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Father, may you help us right now in these few moments that we spend together looking at the Word of God. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You look at these first few verses of the epistle of John. In fact, we differentiate the epistles from the gospel of John. The epistles are the letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. The gospel of John is that uh, gospel record right in the beginning of the New Testament. But notice here what he says in these first few verses of this epistle. He's speaking about Jesus. The word of life is Jesus. I mean, he gives a whole description here. John testifies to the reality of the incarnation, the idea that Jesus Christ came in human flesh. John says, we've touched him. We've been able to hug on him. We've seen him with our eyes. We've heard him. And that one who came in human flesh, that's the one we're declaring unto you. And that's the one that we've had fellowship with. Yes, the fellowship's different than what it was on this earth, but we have a fellowship with him. And that fellowship that we have with him, we can also have with one another. This fellowship wasn't just when Jesus was here. It does continue to the day that John was writing and ultimately for you and I. And this is the basis of our fellowship. It's Jesus Christ. Verse number four actually lays out the reason for John writing this five-chapter letter. And what does he say about the reason for writing here? This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. But I want to back up to actually to verse number four. These things write we unto you. Now, why is he writing? That your joy might be full. The idea of being full is complete. You realize when a person is rightly related to Jesus Christ, there is a joy that cannot be rocked by any earthly problems. Nothing can affect you. Sure, you may have a little slump and you may find yourself walking through discouraged, but I'm just going to tell you there's nothing that can rob you from that. If you are living for the happiness of the things of this world, you've got your attention in the wrong place. Jesus saved you so that way you have fellowship with him. You can know you're going to heaven. But as you face every aspect of this life, John is saying that your joy may be full or complete. But again, it's not the only reason John wrote the letter. Chapter 2, verse 1, we'll look at a little bit later. Notice he says here, my little children, these things write I unto you. Uh, chapter 2, verse 26, he gives another reason for writing. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. That is, those who are trying to lead you down another path, theologically speaking. And then chapter 5, verse 13, a verse we all know well these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. And I'll look at that a little later in the message. But this book of First John, and I'm, I decided in, in my study here a few weeks ago to actually cover this separately. One of the next times we go through uh, these epistles of John, we'll cover Second and Third John together. But I felt it was important to keep First John separate here. But First John is a very simple book, but don't let its simplicity fool you. It's a profound book. And you say, well, how in the world is it simple? John uses a lot of simple words. When I first took Greek in college, 
The book that they had us go through and translate was 1 John. And the reason we did 1 John is because John uses a lot of simple words, light, fellowship. You go all the way through. Unlike Paul's epistles where he's using justification, glorification, sanctification. And sometimes there's some words that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is using that was not really used a whole lot in the general Greek culture. So Paul's writings are are more profound on the surface, but when you look at John, you go, oh, that's a simple book, but I'm just telling you, there is some great profound truth if you begin to unearth the gold that is below the surface. Powerful book. And you know, the Christian life, I hope you understand the Christian life is that way. The more that you grow, the more you realize, the less you know. The more experiences you have in this Christian life, the more you study the Word of God as you go in and open another door and you say, oh, I'm finally arriving to something. And all of a sudden you open that door and there's a huge room of stuff that you've never noticed before. That's the way the Scriptures are. And how beautiful it is that till the day God takes you home, you, I trust, will ever be learning and growing in the things of God. Don't let yourself stop. Don't look at the Scriptures and say, well, yeah, I've read that before. I'm telling you, this book is a living book, and it'll speak to you in great ways. But what's the book all about? Well, I want you to think here. The book is a very simple and straightforward book about a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship that we have with other people And it's all about how to live out the practicalities of the Christian life. John MacArthur summarized in his quick reference guide to the Bible, I like the way he says this, John serves, that is the epistle of 1 John, serves like a cover letter for the gospel of John, filled with practical ways to live out the Christian life that begins by believing in Jesus. Let's go ahead and jump into our outline uh, that we have and, and talk about some of the major uh, parts of this uh, this book here. First of all, the attributes of First John. The attributes. Who is the author? Well, similar to the book of Hebrews, there is no human author identified in this book. But unlike Hebrews, we have a greater idea of who the author is. I personally believe, and most people, most of the commentators that I have read through, uh, dozens of commentators, believe that John, that is the apostle, that disciple that was with Jesus, is the author. And here's a couple of reasons why we believe John is the author. Number one, it had to be somebody who knew Jesus Christ well. Think about this. Look at the text verses. What's John saying here? Verse number one. That which was from the beginning. Well, who was from the beginning? He says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Who was that Word? Verse 14 of John 1, that Word became flesh. Who became flesh? Jesus. All right? You follow this reasoning here. John's not naming him right out the gate here as, all right, this is Jesus, but he's referencing him as the Word of life. And that Word of life, he says, I've heard him. I've seen him with my own eyes, my hands. I've shaken his hand. I mean, think think about what he's saying here. I've taken my arms and put them around him and hugged him. So literally what John is saying here is, "I, I, I know him well, and so the author had to be somebody who knew Jesus well. It was somebody who was who personally heard him. It was somebody that had been there to receive the commandment concerning love. Look at in chapter 3, verse 23. Look what he says here. And this is his commandment. What is it? That we should believe on the name of the Son, his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Look at the last few words. As he gave us commandment. You go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 13, I believe, or 14. Here's here's what John is saying. Here's a new commandment that Jesus gave us. 
And now John, many years later, is writing out in his epistle, I heard him give that commandment. So why do I believe it's John? Well, first of all, it had to be somebody who knew Jesus Christ well. Number two, it had to be somebody who was older and had authority. You read through the Gospel of John, here's a common phrase, comes up nine times, little children, little children. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, verse 12, verse 13, verse 18, verse 28, chapter 3, verse 7, and on through there you can see it. The idea of his use of the phrase, I write unto you, I write unto you, seems to beckon somebody who has this authority behind him. But I believe probably the most important reason why we can assess that John wrote this epistle is when you look at the gospel of John and the epistle of 1 John and you look at them together and you see the similarities that are there. In fact, here's some of the things that you see that are similar. Both the gospel and epistle contrast between light and darkness. Both the epistle and the gospel talk about the unity of the Father and the Son. Both the gospel and the epistle talk about the paraclete. In 1 John 2, verse number 1, he talks about how we have an advocate with the Father. That's the Greek word paraclete. But in John 14 and 15, John uses there the same Greek word paraclete, but it's translated in English, comforter. So similar things that are talked about here. God sending Christ into the world out of love. Both, both books talk about it. Jesus coming in the flesh, being Jesus being born of God. The fact we ought to abide in Jesus. John 15 talks about abiding in Jesus. So does 1 John in many different places. Well, how about this? We're speaking about the author. When would you say John wrote this? Well, it was probably later on in his life. Again, he's writing from the perspective as an elder, physically older, but he probably wrote this towards the end of his life around 90 to 95 AD. And who was it written to? Well, the book not only does not identify the author, it does not identify the audience as well. But whoever it was that John wrote to, it seems that as you read 1 John, the author and the audience knew each other well. So it's possible that John, having spent a lot of time in Ephesus, probably wrote his book to Ephesus, but a number of the other churches around there. Remember, some of Paul's letters are what we call cyclical letters. In other words, Paul might have written Philippians to the church at Philippi, but Colossae got the letter, Ephesus got the letter, it's circled around, and I believe John's letter might have done that as well. Let's talk about the outline, the outline of the book of 1 John. Now, I tell you from time to time, I will often utilize an outline that I think I just cannot improve on. John Phillips, in his book, gives an excellent outline of 1 John, and so I'm stealing it tonight, but with his permission. Well, I never asked him, but I mean... I'm letting you know I'm using it. But I want to put the outline up here. For taking, first of all, chapters 1 and 2, I'm going to give these to you, and then we'll, go, we'll just walk through them. Experience the light of God. That's chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 3 and 4, experience the love of God. And then chapter 5 is experience the life of God. So the light of the love, and the life of God. When you go through chapters 1 through 2, there's a great contrast between light and darkness. And the fact that God is light and there's no darkness in Him. And that light determines our fellowship with Him as well as fellowship with one another. So you see that in the first two chapters. But then notice here, chapter 3, verse number 1. Notice how we jump in. We start moving away from the idea of light, even though it's not, it's not completely forgotten. But behold, chapter 3, verse 1, what manner of, next word, love. What manner of love. So we see that the love that God has given to us. Now, I love this. The word is the word bestowed. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed. Now, we don't use that word a whole lot. 
But literally, the word bestow means to give. Does that sound familiar with John's other writing in the gospel? For God so loved the world that he, you realize the same Greek word is gave in John 3, 16 and bestowed in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, powerful. This love that God has given to us is a love that's to be demonstrated to other people. And I'm going to get into that in a few moments. But then chapter 5, experience the life of God. How does spiritual life begin? Begins with faith in Jesus Christ. You see that right out of the gate in chapter 5. And John wrote that we might know not just the truth of salvation, but that we might know that we have assurance of salvation. And again, I will touch on that a little bit later. Let's analyze 1 John, the analysis of 1 John. A couple of things I, 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 that, there, and really there's a lot of things I could have drawn out. But I didn't think you wanted to stay here until midnight. So let me just give you a couple of things that I think will be some highlights. First of all, sin. You like that word? You're like, oh, preacher, please. Don't, don't, don't touch it. Well, let's just talk about sin for just a moment. Let me give you, let me, let me kind of just talk from a general standpoint of the Gospel of John, and then we'll get a little more specific about the subject of sin. Why does John write this letter? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye, what? Sin not. Well, now you might ask yourself this question. Well, wait a minute. What is sin? Go to chapter 3, verse number 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That is, the law is set out, you cross over it. You go beyond what God has asked you. It is really a rebellion. What does Jesus' blood do for our sin? Go back to chapter 1, verse number 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, the last phrase, his son cleanses us from all sin. What if we do sin? What, what's to happen? Well, chapter 2, verse 1, we looked at earlier. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And what if we go ahead to him and we confess our sins? Well, I love this in chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, as John writes about sin, he gives these general things and answers some questions about what is sin? What do we do if we sin? What happens? And all these questions are answered. But I think now as we go in, there's some detailed things about sin that I, I, I sometimes I believe on the surface as we look at it, we say, uh, I don't know about that. Well, let me, let me answer a couple of those. First of all, go to chapter 1, verse number 8 and 9. You and I must all wrestle with the fact that we are sinners. Now you say, preacher, come on, I, I'm born again, I'm saved. I, I, I get it that I'm a sinner. Well, think about this. John's writing to a group of believers. This is not to unsaved people. These are people that are being affected by a false doctrine. And so let's look at verse 8 of chapter 1. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What is he saying here? There's a tendency based upon false doctrine that comes down the pike for us to start making light of sin, to start excusing it. To start saying to other people, well, you understand, I've kind of grown up this way. I've inherited this trait that I have. I am, a, 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 I, I just simply make mistakes. No, 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 let's get back at what it's saying here. You and I are sinners. We are sinners by choice. We are sinners by nature. There's no getting around it. And Jesus Christ came to forgive us of our sins because here's what he's telling us here. Look, you do have sin, 
And not the word if is not, well, if, if you have sin. No, 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 we all have sin. But the idea is when or since you come and you confess your sins, what does God do? He will forgive you and he will cleanse you. But I think there's something interesting in verses 8 to 9 to help us see a little bit more about sin. And notice here in verse 8, sin is singular. Notice in verse number 9, it is plural. So if we say that we have no sin, singular, verse number 9, if we confess our sins, I think this is a very important distinction to made. That is a distinction from the, the root, that's the singular sin, the sin principle, and the fruit of it, which are all the actions that come about. Sin is that fallen part of us that uh, we desire to be like God in some form or fashion. We may not say that to ourselves, but we want to live independent. That's what our sin is all about. And we, we want, uh, in our sin, we want the world to revolve around us. We always try to be the center of things. And what is all of that? It's pride. It's It's sin. And that's the root of it, and those sins are the things that are be, to be brought before God and were to seek confession. And what John is zeroing in and really getting in on is this. If you and I say that we have no sin, in other words, I, I, I've got no capacity to commit sins. If we deny the very possibility that there is sin in our life, then what he's saying is, you and I are deceiving ourselves. And I say, come on, pastor, does this really happen? Are there really people that say that they have no sin? Well, think with me for just a moment. There are some cults that will teach this very thing. There are cults like Christian science. There are non-Christian religions like uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and others that will teach that uh, uh, sin is just a figment of your imagination. There's no objective reality to sin. And so I have, it, it's sad that some Christians might fall into this. But then there are some that believe that uh, when they got saved, that the sin nature was eradicated from them. You ever heard of some groups called holiness groups? Oh, there are some of those. I, I wouldn't say all of them, but some of them who believe that, that they, you know, they have not sinned for a number of years. I said, well, you, you just told, you know, sin right there. You just lied right now. They base this on another scripture, which I'm going to get to in a few moments. But I tell you, it'd be important for you to probably use the tactic of D.L. Moody. Somebody came up to him one time back in the late 1800s when he was alive. And they told D.L. Moody that they had reached the place where they no longer sinned. And Mr. Moody, in his very practical way, said, well, I'd like to ask your wife about that, you know. And that's very true. But there's also a group of Christians who believe that somehow they can be free from sin by walking in the Spirit. Now, I understand a principle. Yes, when we walk in the Spirit and don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, we're not sinning. But I tell you, there are many Scriptures that tell us we ought to be careful. Paul told us, he who thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. And there are temptations that are coming our way all the time. So, we have this sin nature. There is sin that is abounding. And when we do sin, the beauty is we can come before God and ask for, and ask, and actually seek confession. Notice here, and, and I, this is a subject for a whole nother sermon, but there is a difference between confession and forgiveness. People often talk about, well, I, I, I just got to ask forgiveness from God. Let me tell you, God forgave you at the cross. You know what God is looking for you to do as a believer when you sin is to confess it before him. What is that? The word confess literally means this, to agree with God. God says you did something wrong, that's sin. You come before God and say, God, that deed, that word that I said, uh, that, that attitude that I displayed, that was wrong. And I'm confessing it before you. 
Well, notice here, chapter 3. Let me give you another specific area about sin to help you understand. Chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, you say, wait a minute, preacher. I just thought you, you told us there, there's a sin principle in every one of us. Well, let me, let me get verse number 9, then I'll explain it. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Oh, so we read these verses and we think to ourselves, well, wait a minute. That seems to contradict what chapter 1 says. Well, I want you to notice that the, wor the, the wording that is given here is, not, is this idea of a habitual sin, a repetitive thing. The greater question that you ought to ask is, this, not do you sin or not sin, it's how do you react when you sin? Do you give in to the pattern of sin? Do you let it dominate your life? Or when something does happen, you are so grieved in your soul that you go and seek God to make it right with him, and you desire to live in the power that Jesus Christ alone can give you. This is why it's really hard sometimes to see believers who make excuses for their sin. They don't humbly confess those things before God. You see, unless sin is dealt with squarely, it'll contribute to a pattern of sin. Now, I want you to think in your life for just a moment. Is there something that's got a grip on you? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Are there sins that you're committing on a very regular basis and you find yourself just, you know, it's, it's okay that you can live with it? I want to tell you, you need to evaluate some things in your life. Let's go to one other area and I'll be done with this. Chapter 5, verse 16. Again, I'm just... I can only really give things on the surface here. But notice chapter 5, verse 16. Uh, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now, notice the phrase that is given here. There is a sin unto death. Now, as long as I've been a believer and as long as I've been a pastor, there probably hasn't gone a few months where I don't get asked this question, pastor, what's the unpardonable sin, if you will, kind of using the phrase Jesus used? What's that sin that's unto death? What is that sin that God won't forgive? Well, first of all, I want to help you with your reading of this, and I want you to look at that phrase once again, and I want you to take a one-letter word and remove it, and it won't do, I'm telling you, we're not doing heresy here, but there is no article in the Greek language. So in essence, you can read verse 16, this phrase, there is sin unto death, not a sin. When we look at a sin, we say, all right. What is it? No, no, no. There is sin unto death. It's very important that we understand that distinction. John is writing here to the, in the context of a brother, and I don't believe that this death that is the consequence of whatever sin it may be is speaking of a spiritual death. I believe this is speaking of a physical death. Did not Paul talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about those that were sickly unto death because of the way they had treated the Lord's Supper? Yeah, I mean, there, there was some of that. We, we have every reason to believe that that was we're talking about physical. And I believe here, according to this passage, a believer can sin to the point where God believes it's just better to bring him home because they've compromised their testimony and he ought to just bring them home. Now you say, Pastor, when does God do that? that? That's God. That's not for me or for a preacher to go and say to somebody, look, God, God's now drawing a line in the sand. No, no. God takes care of that. But I think it's very important 
for you and I also, notice verse number 17. He says, and there is a sin not unto death. Be careful to think that when every person that is a believer dies an untimely death, it must be because of what verse 16 talks about. Be careful. You'll figure that stuff out when you get with God. But anyways, there's much to be said about sin. We could spend the rest of the night talking about this. But let me give you another point of analysis. Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus came in the flesh. Very clear, given in the scriptures here, especially in this epistle. Why does John talk about Jesus coming to flesh? Why does he start his epistle off, hey, we've handled him, we've held him, we've heard him, we've seen him? Well, there's a group known as Gnosticism that had arisen in this day. The group became called this because there's a Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And the people that had ascribed to this false teaching basically believed that there was a greater knowledge than what the apostles taught. And part of what they believed and felt that they knew is that since matter was evil, there was no way that Jesus as the man could be also God. So they made a distinction between Jesus the man and the Christ so these Gnostics would say, well, Christ came on Jesus the man at baptism and before Jesus died on the cross because God cannot die, death is a result of sin, that, G that, that Christ left Jesus. Well, I want to tell you something. This is a denial of the incarnation. It's a denial that Jesus is both God and man, 100% God, 100% man. Paul dealt with this much when he wrote the book of Colossians, but John made it quite clear. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, John shows how he believes in the incarnation. Look at John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Look at, look at what he says here. He gets pretty, pretty bold using his apostolic authority to label those who believe that, there, that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Who is a liar? But he that denied that Jesus is the Christ. Look at chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come to flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come to flesh, notice, is not of God. So he, he makes it very clear. Let me give you something else, and actually this leads me to my next point. John's epistle is a very black and white epistle. Can you just see that in the verses I just read? Black and white. Now, you read his epistle, you barely find any gray areas. Everything's listed out in black and white. Here's what you see in the epistle of John. Light versus darkness. God versus the world or the wicked one. Truth versus error. Children of God versus children of the devil. On and on you see the stark contrasts in the book. Now, I'll have to say this book is brutally honest. John comes through and just lays it out. Now, I know I look at this audience here, and many of you have different personalities. Some of you, as I look at you, and I'm not looking at anybody right now, but some of you are just black and white people. You just, you're very matter of fact. There are others of, <laughs> I was thinking about him, but I didn't want to name him. He went ahead and gave an amen, but but there's other of you, others of you that are just like, you almost shudder being around the black and white people. Because, boy, you're just, not, not that you're compromising per se, I'm not talking about that, but, boy, you're just, you're, you're, you're very easygoing about your life and you have a hard time. But I love what Joseph Baxter said in his book, Explore the Book, about this. This moral clear-sightedness is always a mark of real spiritual maturity. No need for circuitous windings of arguments. The spirit illuminated inward eyes sees vital moral distinctions immediately, often, ca often causing much annoyance to those who profess more loudly but see more dimly. What hazy seeing and pious parlayings with questionable practices there are amongst Christian believers today. 
Look through this first epistle of John again and mark well the significant fact that this epistle, which is distinctly that of Christian love, is at the same time the epistle of no compromise. You'll see that when you read through it. Let me give you something else. Tests of genuine Christianity. Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to breeze through this. You write this down. I want you to study this later. John, in writing this epistle, is wanting us to see that Christianity is to be real and genuine. And you know what John does? He actually gives some tests. He said, let me show you what I mean by real Christianity. Let me show you what I mean by genuine Christianity. And every time you see this phrase, if we say, or another phrase, he that saith. Now, all of us understand we have a lot of people who talk a lot, don't we? It's pretty amazing. You know, I like the way it says, somebody once said that your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Did you get that? Think about it. We say a lot of things, but our life speaks much more, much more loudly than anything we say. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. I'm just going to give these to you quickly. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So there's a test of our fellowship with God. Same chapter, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Last verse of chapter 1. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Chapter 2, verse 6, he that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Chapter 2, verse 9, he that saith, he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. Chapter 4, verse number 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. You see how the tests are given? If, if you're going to say something, but you're living a complete different way, mm -mm, that doesn't cut it with God. just doesn't cut it. Announcement of Christ in 1 John. What's the announcement? Two things of chapter 2 I see. Could pull out any number of things. Chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus is our advocate. Powerful word. He's our lawyer, our go-between, if you will. Chapter 2, verse 22, Jesus is the Christ. It's very interesting. The article is used in front of this. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He's the anointed one, literally. Now let's go ahead and finish out with the application of 1 John. Go to chapter 5, if you will, the application Look at verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Here's a question I want to ask you in application. Do you know? You say, know what? Do you know that you're saved? God didn't give salvation so you could live all of your Christian life with a fuzzy mentality. Well, I hope so. No, I like the way preachers have often said about this passage of Scripture, God has given to us a no-so salvation, K-N-O-W. 
God didn't give salvation and say, I hope you figure it out. I hope you know what it is. But I'm telling you, the biggest thing for me as a, as, as a believer, when I settled years ago on having assurance of salvation, it was number one. I had to come to the fact that I had truly trusted in Christ and that God promised eternal life to me. Look at verse 12. Every time I lead someone to Christ, I always share verse 12. I read it this way. I'll say, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, I look at a person that, get, that I just led to Christ, and I'll ask them this question. What did you just do? Well, I, I prayed. What did you pray? I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. All right? Jesus forgave you of your sins. Therefore, what has he promised you? Eternal life. All right? So that means that you're in the group that the Bible says, he that hath the Son, what do they have? They have life. That word hath is the idea of a present possession. God doesn't say to us, well, someday maybe I'll give it to you. That's the way we work with people. We make these far-fetched promises. But God says, I'm giving to you eternal life, and you have it right now. It's powerful. So to me, the, the assurance of salvation is based on the fact of the Scriptures that God says, if I believe in Him, I have eternal life. And it's not based on feelings. You ever had somebody say to you, I, I just don't feel saved? No, no, that's, that's really the wrong statement. Salvation is not based on a feeling. Salvation is based on a fact. So the question is, do you know? Could I encourage you tonight, if you're wrestling with your salvation, you need to read this epistle of 1 John. You need to go through it because it talks about the experiences that we should enjoy and do enjoy as believers. Let me give you number two. Go to chapter 4, verse number 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Go to chapter 5, verse number 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What's the application? You and I are overcomers. We're overcomers. You know, sometimes we look at the evil in this world and we go, wow, that devil, he's powerful. Greater is he that's in you. God who lives in you created the devil. Someday he's going to take him and he's going to cast him in the lake of fire forever and ever. Amen. He's more powerful than any demon. Any, anything that goes on in this world, God is more powerful. And I'm here to tell you that it's sad for me as a pastor to walk to see Christians walking through this life as if that's what they're secluded to is a life of failure and a lack of victory. But you have what you need in Jesus Christ to live a victorious life. You are a victor. But then I want you to notice the last area, practical Christian living. There's so many things that John gives practically, but here's one of them. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. Actually, let me begin chapter 3, verse 23. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. You know, real, practical Christian living is right where the rubber meets the road. Again, there's a lot of people that talk. But your walk talks a whole lot louder. Go to chapter 3, verse 17. Let me, let's get a little more specifically. Love one for one another. Yeah, that's important. But now that love needs to exceed your words. Verse 17, chapter 3, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. Read the last words with me. 
How dwelleth the love of God in him? Huh. Practical Christianity. We have a lot of Christians who say they love God and who say they love other believers, but will never lift up a finger to help that other believer. Sad. May it be that this church, now I understand you can't always help other people. Sometimes when you help people, there have to be guidelines that are set in place. Because sometimes it might sour a relationship. But I'm telling you, we need more people who say that they love God and say they love people, but they demonstrate that love by helping. It's powerful. So many more things I could share about the practical Christianity, and I'm not going to tonight. But this, this book is so rich, so profound. I studied it this week, and I, I almost was tempted to make a part B of it because there's just so much truth in this. And again, I, 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 I really trust that these little studies will actually whet your appetite. Maybe you've taken something down that you can just go back later and say, you know what, I, I want to study that a little bit more. I want to look through that. May, may it really... Uh, enrich your study of the epistle of 1 John. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for today. <clears throat> thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that you gave to us here. Thank you for using this writer, John, to pen these words that you had for us. I pray that we would have real Christianity. May Calvary Baptist Church not be known as a surface-level church, but may it be that the people here would be genuine, truthful, honest in their relationship with you and with others. May we not just say we love other people, but may we demonstrate it. Pray that you'd help us, Lord. While heads are bowed, eyes are closed, maybe God's spoken to you tonight. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet with your heads bowed and eyes closed. And maybe tonight you say, Preacher, I, I've, I've just kind of been living a surface level life. Well, I want to encourage you tonight to go ahead and make do right now. Settle some things with God. Say, God, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to live any longer just as a surface-level Christian, but I want to start living out practically for Thee. May God help us. If God's spoken to your heart, I'm going to invite you to come and pray. Right now, I'm going to go ahead and kneel at one of the chairs on the stage here and pray for you as a church family and myself. May God help us be real. Would you come and join me tonight in prayer as we live out what this epistle has spoken about?